Hi there. I'm Kurt Steinbrook, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church. And we are going through the book of Romans in this series of videos. Today, we're going to be looking at Romans 12, 9 through 21, which is a lot more verses than we normally do, but that's because this is on a Saturday. And so on Saturdays, I like to read the readings that we're going to have for the service tomorrow uh, so that you can start to prepare your heart for worship tomorrow. Speaking of which, if you're in the Wesley Chapel area, I'd love to invite you out to worship with us tomorrow or whatever Sunday might be coming up for you if you're watching this um, after its release. Uh, we meet at 11 a.m. to search for Faith Lutheran Church in Wesley Chapel, and I'm sure you can find us. Or you can go to our website at faithwesleychapel.com, and we'd love to have you come out. All right, so before we get started, let's take a moment to pray, and then we'll dig into this passage. Heavenly Father, please be with us as we spend this time reading through your word, spending time with you. Lord, we pray that you would uh, enable us to understand what we read, to believe it, to accept it, and to be strengthened by it. Lord, strengthen our faith during this time and help us to see you to, as you reveal yourself and to see ourselves as you show us who we are in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to start by reading the passage. This is Romans 12. Let me share it with you real quick. There we go. All right, so Romans 12, 9 to 21. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Living in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So uh, in this section, it's divided up into kind of two, three sections uh, of these things that are listed here. Uh, the first uh, verses nine through 13 is addressing what love looks like between believers, between Christians. The second section, which is a kind of a transitional section, would be verses 14 through 16, which kind of hits on both the believers and those who are outside the faith. And then the last section is uh, verses 17 through 21, which addresses how Christians should treat non-Christians, those who don't believe. So this, this section, it starts with this phrase, let love be genuine. And it's a it's kind of a hard phrase to be translated. So you'll see different translations of this like let love be genuine uh make your love uh, authentic um even love is authentic or love is genuine and i think that's actually more what it's getting at see there's no verb in the greek and so it can be translated as a command but it seems more likely that it's an opening title to this section it's a description of love that then is filled out by what comes after it. So it's kind of like with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, right? These, yes, there's an implicit 
command to it that since we're supposed to love, we should be kind and we should be patient. But the way that it's spoken is as a description. And that is really how this starts, is actually more of this is what genuine love is. This is what love is in the church between believers. This is what love is outside the church when we're interacting with those who do not believe. Now, tomorrow, we're going to really just hone in on that first concept. Let love be genuine, or love is genuine. And we're going to be, be talking about that a lot tomorrow in our worship service. So today, I want to focus in more on the second phrase of verse 9, which is, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Or really, how we probably should be translating this is more like, Love is genuine, abhorring what is evil and clinging to what is good. So what does it mean to abhor something? To abhor something is to hate it. It's to, uh, to have revulsion over it, right? Even some descriptions are, uh, or some definitions would say that it's a violent hatred of something. That we are to abhor what is evil. Now, sometimes we actually desire what is evil, if we're being honest. And sometimes we do, because we, we're sinners. We have a sinful nature, and sometimes that sinful nature desires what is evil. But I think we kind of understand that, and we can, we can usually recognize it, even if we give in to that temptation. We can usually see what's going on there, that this is our sinful self, uh, you know, rebelling against God and you know, the best way to deal with that is to recognize the evil for what it is and then to resist it, to, you know, to recognize the evil, recognize the desire, then resist it with prayer and maybe some other practical things that we might do, like getting help from other people or setting boundaries in one way or another. All of these things can be helpful for us to resist uh, our sinful nature's desire for evil. But what I'd like to focus in a little more on today is something that I think is a little less obvious for us, and that is our complacency with evil. That there are times when we may recognize something that's evil, um, maybe in ourselves or, or maybe in others or just in the world around us. And we may see that it's wrong and recognize that on, on an intellectual level, we know it's evil. And we may even avoid it ourselves, but we kind of just ignore it in the world around us and in the people around us. We take the attitude of, you know, well, I mean, I wouldn't do that, but, you know, if you want to go ahead, it's your life. Rather than being, you know, to hate the evil, to be revolted, have revulsion to the evil, we're just kind of okay with it. But love isn't ambivalent towards evil. It doesn't just excuse evil. It abhors evil. It hates it. It can't stand to see it or to be a part. Love opposes evil. Now, of course, this can be difficult. Because, well, amongst other things, there's a lot of evil. There's a lot of things, and, and we only have so much time, so much emotional energy that we can put towards things. So what do we do? Well, first, we can pray. We can pray not only for the specific evils that we see, but for God to help us to see good and evil the way he does. To have that same reaction to evil that God has, which is to abhor evil. And as we do so, we may find that one or two of these things really affect us more than the rest, which can lead to more prayer about it. And maybe that then gives us a strong desire to do something about it, where we start to support people or organizations that are fighting. Or maybe in the absence of those things, or just from you know, the, the impetus of the Holy Spirit, we may start something ourselves. Go do something ourselves in order to stop this evil, to fight it. Because we start to have that God-given 
hatred of the evil. Love for the people, but hatred of the sin that's going on. And so we can fight it. Now, the other side of this is to not only abhor what is evil, but to cling to what is good. Right? There's a positive side to this. And the world, or the word for cling here, it's interesting because um, the word is actually used elsewhere in the Bible for marital or spiritual union. Yeah, so the idea here is to deeply and intimately hold on to what is good. You know, so love holds tight to what is good, to what is of God. And similar to the evil, of course, this can also be overwhelming to, to see all these things that are good that may be, uh, you know, threatened or, uh, you know, one way or another, they're, they're being pushed aside. But again, through prayer, and God's guidance, we may find that there are certain aspects of good that we are continually feel the need to pray about, to support, and even to do something about, to see to it that that good is being maintained. Now, of course, this can also be difficult because what is good is not always what we want or what others want, right? I mean, the reality is that broccoli is good, but my kids hate it. You know, so what is good for us is not always what is wanted. And so as we fight for what is good, as we cling to it for both ourselves and for others, that that may not make us popular. In fact, it may make you hated and despised. I mean, just consider what it means to stand up for like abstinence or to stand up for the church and uh you know the the values that we see in the bible today or even just the message of jesus christ and that he is the one way to salvation not going to make you very popular like now of course if we're going to talk about it then that's another thing we can do right we can express ourselves about what is good and what is evil and i think that also is something that is very difficult for us today I mean, lately, with cancel culture and just the way people are not only uh, pushing for their own ideas, but are uh, opposed to anybody having a different idea. And we've kind of lost the, the, the concept that, that two people can have differing ideas. And so you have this insistence, not only do I want to have what I believe uh, to be I guess, enforced or whatnot, but it needs to be agreed to by everyone around. And so what we can end up doing sometimes is just out of fear, maybe self-preservation. Uh, we just kind of go quiet, right? We just kind of shut up and let people live their lives and don't do anything. Just keep your head down, right? Now, there's a famous quote uh, that goes something like, uh, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And there's some debate about who who said it and all this, but there is there's an element of truth there. That when we can see what is good and what is evil, but we say nothing and we do nothing, it allows evil to prevail. And it allows good to get squashed. And this is uh, just, you know, kind of the, the reality of love, but love won't stay silent. Love can't just stand by. It has to do something. It has to speak of that genuine love. Now, of course, all this implies that we know what is good and what is evil, which is a whole other problem. How do we know what is good? And evil? Because, you know, the reality is that the world often calls things that are evil good and things that are good evil. So how are we supposed to know? And this really isn't anything new. Let me share this with you. This is um, Isaiah. Pull it up. Isaiah 5.20. Woe to you, or woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. All right. So here we have Isaiah warning about those people who would do exactly what we see happening so often in the world around us. So it can be a challenge 
it can be a challenge for us to know what is good and evil. So what we must do is we have to turn to the source of God, which is God, and his revelation to us of what is good and what is evil in his word. So we open up the Bible. So we listen to, to those who can teach us about the Bible, but even that we have to be careful with because, you know, there are pastors and theologians who will say things are good that are evil and evil that are good. This is also something that isn't new. Let me share this with you. This is 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. In other words, there are pastors and church leaders and theologians and whatnot who will just tell you what you want to hear rather than telling you what is true. So the more we know the Bible, the more uh, time we're spending in prayer and seeking God, the better we are at knowing good and evil. And the better that we are at identifying those, those church leaders who are just trying to tickle our ears. And so the more we know about what is good and what is evil from God's word, the more we can pray about it, the more we can talk about it, the more we can do something about it. And that's what love does. That's what true love does. It genuinely abhors evil and clings to what is good, not only for ourselves, but for those around us for their benefit as well. So I pray that for us, our love would be genuine, that we would learn to abhor what is evil and to cling to what is good. Amen. All right. Well, if you're in the area, I invite you once again to come and join us tomorrow for worship, um, whether it's the actual tomorrow when this video is posted or sometime down the road. Uh, we'd love to have you come and worship with us. So uh, in the meantime, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. God bless.